Father, we just love you and we thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. And thank you that you sent your spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here. That you are the one that's helping us, carrying us, growing us. You are the one that's the power of God at work in us. And I pray tonight that as we, as we speak on what happened in Acts, that you will just re-energize and that you will just come and move with your power over our souls. Thank you, Lord, that we know that you are here. Because we know where you said, two or three are gathered in your name, there you are. I pray tonight for revelation. I pray that you will bring truth and that people will be set free by your truth and that we will experience your kingdom, love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, we started off with Acts, working through the book of Acts last week, and uh, we finished with Acts 1, and uh, we're stepping into Acts 2, and my th topic for tonight is receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, as we go into Acts 2, we see that Jesus has now ascended to heaven, and um, he's given the disciples instructions to go back to Jerusalem to wait for what the Father has promised. And we know that this promise was the promise of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, Jesus told them it's to their advantage if he leaves. John 16, 7 says, but I tell you truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And they must have thought, how is it better that Jesus goes away? Jesus is awesome. We want him here. But he said it's better for me to go. Now remember... They already received the Holy Spirit. When Jesus breathed over them in John 20, he just said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that is when they were born again. And they received the Spirit of God. Yet, Jesus still told them to go and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit that will come upon them and make them effective witnesses for him. And they must have wondered, how are we going to do this? Be effective witnesses, and this is where Acts 2 comes in, where the Holy Spirit came upon them as about 120 people were gathered together in one place. Now, the Bible tells us, we're going to read it now, that when the Spirit of God came, it was like a rushing wind. There was a noise, a violent wind, and then when this occurred, all the people in Jerusalem heard this, and many gathered together to see what was happening. And out of this group of people, the church would be born. Now, all of this happened at the Feast of Pentecost. And many Israelites um, journeyed to Jerusalem for this time and for this feast. Now, because this also occurred at Pentecost, it is many times called the birth of the church. Now, Pentecost it literally means the 50th day because it's celebrated 50 days after the Passover. Now, the event in Acts 2 is very important for us to understand because the relationship we have with God our Father is because of the working of the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God working in us that moves on our spirit so that our, our relationship with the Father can grow. Can grow. It has everything to do with how we live in our relationship to God. And if we will live a life of victory or not. And if we will grow in the life of faith. And as we continue to study through Acts over the next few weeks, we will see how important it is to live a life flooded and um, led by the Holy Spirit. God wants more for us than just to be saved. That's very important. Many people think, I just come to Jesus and I'll just wait for the train to come past to take me to glory land. No. God's plan for us is that we will walk a life of victory. A life set free from the things of this world that want to destroy us so that we can live as ambassadors of Christ as we grow in faith. So let's read together in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. So when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent 
rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and Mes residents of Mesopotamia, and so he goes on to name all of them. Jump to verse 11. <clears throat> we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. You always have some mockers around. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day, or about nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Just up to there, God bless his wonderful word. So the first important principle is that the Holy Spirit is the life of God. The same way that your spirit is your life, the moment that your spirit departs your body, there is no life left, the Holy Spirit is the life of God. Now, the day of Pentecost is significant. The things that happen in Scripture are not coincidental. They are great truths revealing pictures of what is important on, in our lives in the New Testament. So we are first called to serve God in the life of the Spirit. No more in the life of the law, but the Spirit. The Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, was celebrated, as I said, 50 days after the Passover. Now the Old Testament points towards what God is doing through Christ and through His Spirit in our lives. Now you might remember the Passover was when... Um, Moses told the people to put the blood of a lamb on the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over them. In the same way, Jesus was the Passover lamb. And he was crucified on the same weekend that they were celebrating Passover. Jesus was the lamb. That would, his blood would bring salvation for us so death would pass us over. Death to death and life for me forever. We are set free from death. That is our eternal hope. Then three days after the Passover, Israel found themselves at the Red Sea. And they were bunched up between the Red Sea and Pharaoh. And so then God opened the waters and they were saved as they went through the waters. And their past was annihilated. Egypt and the, the power of Egypt over their lives were broken. Now, we, will, we also know that it's on the third day that Jesus rose from the dead. And he broke the power of sin and death in our lives. And then, by the way, this is also a type, as they went through the Red Sea, a type of the baptism of the believer. We see in 1 Corinthians 10, 2, uh, where Paul writes, and all, talking of the 
Israelites were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So as they went through the sea and the cloud of the presence of God was above them, they were enclosed by water. This was their baptism into the law. Baptism into God saying, I will be your God if you do this. Now in Christ, we are set free from the law. We'll get there just now. But we are saved and we are baptized into our new life with Christ. Now, 50 days after the Passover, Israel came to Mount Sinai where they received the law. So they received instructions from God on how to live and to honor them, him. Now, 50 days after Jesus was crucified, the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And instead of the law being given, the power of God was poured into them so that they would know the laws written on their hearts, how to honor God. So we see these two ministries. We see the ministries of law and the ministry of the Spirit. And Paul speaks on this in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 8. He says, if the ministry of death, because law brought death. If the ministry of death in letters engraved on stone came with glory. Now you'll remember, even though it was the ministry of death, the law, when Moses was in the presence of God, his face shone with glory. Now Paul says, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more of glory? Now that we're not under the law, but under the Spirit of life, he says the glory will even be more. We will see God's goodness, God's glory, God's power more. Romans 7, 6 says, now we have been released from the law so that we serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now it's written on our hearts. Everything changes. And that brings us to another place. That brings us to a place where we understand that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That is the kingdom of God. God's heart is that we should have joy. The enemy wants to steal your joy because there is power in joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It makes us strong. We're not under the obligation of law anymore because the law made it difficult. We'll get to that now. We're not under the obligation of law. We now have the life of God himself inside of us, stirring in us what he wants. Romans 7 verse 7 says the following. I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. So in other words, he uses the sin of coveting, but you can take any other sin. As soon as God says, don't do this, do not covet, do not be envious, do not um, be lustful, do not want your neighbor's things, or do not murder, sin took opportunity, the flesh, and saying, but now I want it. I can't have it, so I want it. It is like the serpent in the garden. You want this fruit? can't have it. Now I want it. See, sin brought this coveting. I want this. A good illustration of this is say you want to go on an extreme diet. None of us need that. But <clears throat> So you're going on an extreme diet of water and crackers. That's all you eat. But all you can think of is ice cream and chocolates. Because... <laughs> You're just eating crackers and water, and it is so difficult. And um, one day you're sleepwalking, and you find yourself stuffed with chocolates when you wake up because you just cannot stay away from these things. And every time you feel like a failure, no, I must just have crackers and water. I cannot do this. But the moment that I understand the life that is in nutritious food, it changes everything. If I start to eat healthy, I start to eat healthy things, after a while I say, I don't want those things. I must tell you, for example, if I go to the gym, I do. 
<laughs> if I go to the gym, after a while, I don't want to eat chocolates anymore. Say, this is not worth it. I don't want this. And by the way, it gives me, I get sinus attacks. So I don't want any chocolate in my life because it's not good for me. I don't like it. It's not because I don't, I'm not allowed to have it. I just don't want it. When I start to eat more healthy, I feel more healthy. And it's the same. God changes our perspective. And he says, it's not about the law anymore. Trying to uphold these things, not doing. He says, now you focus on me. I have upheld the law for you. Now I'm living in you. And my spirit changes you from glory to glory. And as you grow and fall in love with me, these things let go of you. You don't want this anymore. You want the beautiful life. Many people are spiritually empty because they look for the answer in all the wrong places, stuck in despair and loneliness and heartache, longing for love, and it gets people in much trouble. No one can fill you up with the love you need. Only God can do that. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says the following. He said to them, go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, send portions to him who has nothing prepared. In other words, let's feast. For this day is a holy day to the Lord. What? Feasting on a holy day? Shouldn't it be a sullen affair? God's plan was never that the, the feasts of Israel must be sullen affairs. It's a feast. It's a time of feasting and rejoicing on the love and provision of God. But the law has made it a sullen affair. God says your spiritual life is not a sullen affair. It's a joyful thing. You have been set free from death forever. The power of the enemy has been broken in your life. Great things is to come. My thoughts towards you are good. Be joyful. Do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you know what? It takes less muscles to smile than to frown. That's a scientific fact. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Galatians 5.22, for this fruit of the Spirit... And this is the fruit that the Spirit works in us, is love, joy, peace. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. That's God's plan. Turning our mourning into dancing. And this is why it's so important to be baptized in the Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is so Important. Now, Jesus told them to wait for the Holy Spirit, which would soon come upon them, saying, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, the day of Pentecost then was a fulfillment of this promise. But we need to look at these things to carefully understand what it means for us today. Now, there are many in the body of Christ who don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit anymore saying that it has ceased. And I'm thankful that we're part of a movement, this Calvary Chapel movement, and I'm a pastor here, that we still believe in the move of the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe that God set people free by His Spirit. We believe that God leads us with wisdom and with knowledge. We believe in miracles. We believe in the Spirit of God. However, having said that, I've also experienced the other extreme, where churches who believe that they're exercising the gifts of the Spirit do things that are not in the Word. And I believe that the, Spirit, the Word of God is the final authority of what is allowed and what is not. And as such, we look to the Word. But if Jesus said, you will do greater things, then there will be greater things. But we must know what is from God and what is not. Pastor Rich spoke this morning on discerning. As we are led by the Spirit of God, we can start to discern what is from God and what is not. So first, we see that Pentecost, that specific day, was a very unique day. It's important to say this because many people today seek another Pentecost experience. 
but it was unique. You never read of any of these things in that order happening again. Now, Jesus said they would receive power. We spoke about that last week. Uh, when the Spirit of God came on them, that power is dynamos, and that is the Greek word for um, dynamite. So this was an explosion of the presence of God, um, the grand entrance into planet Earth. This explosion set the church in motion. It is like a kickstart of a bike. And suddenly, there's an explosion of life. But what's unique about Pentecost is that there was first a noise and a violent wind, as we said, that filled the house. Then secondly, there were also cloven tongues of fire on them. And you won't believe this if you go and you study this in Greek. The word fire there means fire. They literally had fire, tongues of fire on them. Now we can all say that this is not a standard practice. Every time someone is baptized in the spirit, we don't see fire on people and there isn't violent winds rushing through this place. This was a very specific thing. They also spoke in other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. Now, as we said, there were a multitude of people coming together for this feast, and they were speaking different languages. Yet, they all heard in their own language them speaking of the mighty works of God. This was a sign to these people that something special was happening. This was not natural. These were all Galileans. How do they know French and, and Russian and Bulgarian? And How do they know these languages? It's impossible. Yet some scoffers said, they're full of wine. Now I want to tell you, I've seen some drunk people before. I've never seen people drink, become drunk, and suddenly start to speak French. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Not even if you drink French wine. It just doesn't <laughs> happen. See, this was a very unique moment. But then Peter stood up and said, listen, you don't understand. This is exactly what was prophesied by the prophet Joel, that the Spirit of God would come. Now, although this was um, a very specific things, I believe that the Holy Spirit do things for a specific reason. And we can see types of this, how this applies to our lives. And I believe a lot of this has to do with surrendering to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I want to emphasize here, surrendering to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because if I just say surrendering to the Holy Spirit, it can be misconstrued that people say, oh, the Spirit took me over. I had no control. Oh, something happened, but it wasn't me. It was the Spirit. And I want to tell you that is not biblical. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul tells the church, because that was happening there, and he told them, listen, the Spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. God will never override your will, but we can surrender to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's God's heart. So, firstly, Jesus referred to the Spirit as wind. And the word Spirit in Greek actually translates to wind. In John 3, 8, Jesus said, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. A great illustration of this is, if you're on the ocean and you're on a sailboat, and the wind comes up, what do you do? Start the engine and go the other route. No, you raise the sails. And the wind catches the sails. And the boat goes where the wind drives it. In the same way, we can be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is doing. Raising our sails in the Spirit. Saying, Holy Spirit, we are willing to be led by you. What do you want to do me today? When I pray in the morning, say, Holy Spirit, I don't know what's going to happen. But you know. I don't know who is going to come over my path, who needs prayer, who needs a word of encouragement. I don't know, but I'm willing to be led by the Spirit. I'm raising my sails. Lead me where you want to lead me. I will follow. I'm available. Where the wind of the Spirit is moving. 
Romans 8, 14 says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. Led by His Spirit. The wind speaks of us surrendering to the leading. Then secondly, we saw tongues of fire. And that reminds us of the fact that the Holy Spirit is equated with fire in the Bible. In the Old Testament, we see in the temple that the fire always had to burn in the temple. It was a type of the presence and the Spirit of God. Now, after the veil was torn with the crucifixion of Jesus, God no longer lives, as we know, in the Holy of Holies. He says now, He does not live in temples built with the hands of man. He lives in us. His fire and His Spirit lives within us. The Spirit of God flows from within. God now resides in us. And many people have the misperception that we are like hotels. God checks in and out of us as He wishes. So God, please come back and use me. No. Jesus said, the Father and I will come and live, abide in you. The power of God is here. My prayer should be, God, I pray that your power will flow through me. Use me. Use me with your power. Thank you that you are here. Now, sometimes we are like a conduit that's a bit blocked because we're busy with so many other things, we're not hearing what God says. So many things we're busy with in our lives. It's like cholesterol in the arteries. And we need to ask Holy Spirit, come and flush this out. And I believe that that's one of the parts of the, of the fire of God. Firstly, His presence. Secondly, um, His power burns out the stuff that should not be there. Fire is cleansing. And we can say, just like the New Testament tells us, that we need to be purified as gold. Heat and fire purifies us. And when I heard this when I was small, I thought, but fire hurts. What if this hurts? What if, what if God hurts me? God is not here to hurt us. But what happens to a piece of paper? It falls into fire. It disintegrates. What happens to wax? It melts away. So when I am... Um, opening up to the Spirit of God and say, God, lead me. I want the fire of your presence. He shows us His glory and all the other things become non-existent. It's not important anymore. It melts away. The fire and the presence of God purifies us. I don't want to do the things I used to do because I've seen His glory. It's beautiful. And then the fire also speaks of passion. We say that person is a, has a fiery personality, passionate. God, work your passion in me. It's His Spirit working in us to will and to work according to His purposes, the fire of God. Then they also started speaking in tongues. And I believe this was a very special event where the Holy Spirit used that gift so that other people could hear. We've read that. But we see that in the baptism of the Holy Spirit can also coincide with people receiving the gift to speak in unknown tongues, not naturally acquired. Paul writes of this in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14. He says, um, you receive a spiritual language, and he says, I speak in that language more than all of you, and I wish that all of you will receive it. Why is this something that happens? And I believe that the reason for this is seen in James 3. James 3.3 3 says, Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct the entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. 
goes on to say that the tongue is a small fire that can light up a whole forest. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And many times we speak things that are not aligned with God's will. If you are speaking over your life, I'm a loser, nothing will happen, nothing will help, um, God is not here, nobody loves me, I'm horrible. You are sowing seeds of anxiety and death into your spirit. That's why we need to speak aligned with the will of God. And I believe speaking in tongues signifies surrendering our tongues to God for his glory. When someone speaks in an unknown tongue, tongue God, to God, it is not filtered through their subjectivity or their paradigm, but speaks mysteries to God perfectly aligned with the will of God. That's what the Bible teaches us. He who speaks, speaks mysteries unto God. We read about this in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, my mind is unfruitful. This shows us that that language is not naturally acquired. I'm not thinking of this. I will pray with a spirit and I will pray with a mind. I will sing with a spirit and I will sing with a mind also. From the scripture we see that we can pray with both of these. It's important to pray with the mind. Many times we are led by the Spirit of God to pray with our mind in our language, be it English or if you're French, French or whatever it is. Because while I am praying, I am praying with other people. They can agree with me. We are stirring up faith and hope and declaring the truth of God. And the Bible says where two or three agree on something, it will come to pass. So we agree together as we speak and as we pray. It strengthens our faith. Sometimes, though, we do not know how to pray in a situation. Have you been there before? Oh, my goodness. I've prayed out all the prayers I can pray, and I don't know what to pray anymore. Romans 8.26 says, In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Holy Spirit knows the perfect will of God. And as such, when we pray in the Spirit, we are praying aligned with the will of God. It is not filtered through my will. It's not filtered through my paradigm. I'm praying the perfect will of God. It's the same with singing. Most of the time when we're together, we sing with our minds. And the reason for that is, um, Paul tells us, uh, teach one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, glorifying God. So while we are singing, we are singing truths. Faith is being built. We're worshiping God. We're together as a choir of worship unto God. So Paul says, I will sing with my mind, but I will sing with my spirit also. Because I've been in places where I've, I've been praising God and I just experience his goodness and his mercy and his grace and the English language just don't have enough words. And when I start to sing in the spirit and start to praise God in the spirit, praising my king. Now, having said that, Paul also gives us very clear direction concerning when we are gathered in large gatherings. We encourage gifts like this to flow in small groups or in your private prayer time. Because it are, there are so much misunderstanding that we have to otherwise regularly correct those who flow incorrectly. Because Paul said, when we are together, let's speak so that people can understand. So that when I speak five words in English, it's worth much more than a thousand words in the spirit for those who hear. So that is why we encourage that people do this in small groups or when they are praying in their own personal prayer time. We must understand that all of this, all the gifts that flow, that the fruit of the spirit is love. 
And what the Spirit does is it is, it is stirring up our love for God more and more. And every fruit and every spirit, a spiritual gift that flows should flow from love. We've seen so many times, I've touched on it last week, that people start to flow in the Spirit and suddenly they become arrogant and proud. I'm better than you because there are more Spirit flowing through me. I'm better than you because the power is working through me. I'm better than you because I'm speaking in tongues. No, that's not what it's about. It's about building up the body and building up the church, edifying those around us. I become a servant through the Spirit of God. Jude 1.20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Then lastly, we saw that um, there's a, a promise that says that we will do greater works. In John 14, Jesus said this, 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. How is this possible? Jesus is the Son of God. He is the embodiment of all power. All authority has been given to him. He is the word through which all the universe exists. How is it possible that we can do greater than he can do? And I believe that we find a clue to this conundrum in verse 17, when Peter tells them, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Jesus' limitation, and I say it in, what do you call these things in colons? <laughs> Jesus is limitations, say it with all respect, was that he was perfectly God, but also perfectly man. So Jesus was in a body. And as such, you know that you cannot be at two places at once. A body limits you. And that's why Jesus said, it's good for me to go away. Because when I go away, I will send my spirit. And his spirit on the day of Pentecost came on all those people that were filled with his power. And as new people came to Christ and become, became believers, the spirit of God filled them as well. And so they could flood the whole world with a message and good news of Jesus, touching people's lives, healing people, bringing the good news of the gospel. And by volume, they could do more than Jesus could do on his own. It is still the spirit of Jesus Christ working through us and through them. And this is a promise for all of us. This is a promise and we have the exciting privilege. Once again, people ask me, do I have to be filled with the Holy Spirit? No, you get to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What a privilege that the creator of heaven and earth, God, King, Lord of all, chooses to, in a feeble person like me, put the power of his spirit. What a privilege. This is the thing we should be hungering for most. God, flood me with your presence. Flood me with your spirit. Empower me, grow your fruit in me, grow your love in me, grow your peace, grow this in me. As I start to surrender to him, come and do what you want to do. Come and flow through me, use me. That's my heart's desire, more and more. You know what, sometimes God knows what he can trust you with. So sometimes I might ask, why don't I have this, this gift of healing, touching people? And maybe God knows it will make me prideful. I'm not there yet. You know what? It's more important that God change my character first. Holy Spirit, I surrender to you. Come and change me. And God, as you trust me more, I pray that your spirit will also flow through me. Come and use me. 
It's my heart's desire. We need a fresh wind. We need the presence of God. I was speaking with Pastor Rich this week and said, you know what, the, the, the church of Corinthians, wow, Paul spoke about they had the power of God the most, but they were the most sinful of all. <laughs> so maybe we shouldn't boast if there's too much power. Maybe God says you need it because there's a lot of sin. But anyway, I'm looking at our world and I see our world is fallen. It's broken. And we never want to, a letter to be a letter of correction. Paul says, listen, you're going off the track. No. But God, we want to be led by your spirit through love to touch the lives of people around us. That there will be something different. People sit in front of you hopeless, saying there's no hope, I've tried everything. You can say, I know a God. I know the God of heaven and earth. I know his spirit. And I know there's a power that can set you free. That's my heart's desire. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And my prayer is, God, let the power of your presence flow from the branch, from the vine into this branch. Come and use me. Come and use me more. I want to be available. Be the wind in my sails. Be the fire in my spirit. Burn out what is not from you. Come and bring a passion. Come restore. Come Come bring new life more and more from within. That streams of living water will flow from my inner being. Do you know what, church? God will never override your will. But I know one thing. If I'm not available, he'll go to the next guy. I heard this said once. I don't know if he was being facetious when he said it. There was a, a great evangelist, Reinhard Bonker. I don't know if you've heard of him before. And he, he said one day, he prayed, and said, he said, God, I'm so thankful that you chose me. God said, don't be so full of yourself. You were the first choice, the third choice. <laughs> Two other guys said no. <laughs> God, don't pass me over. Don't pass me by. I want to be available. I don't want to be so focused on my own life in this world. That one day in heaven, God says, you know what? I had such great things for you, but you chose to resist me. You were so busy. I want to say, God, come and flow through me with the presence of your spirit. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come to the front. We're going to partake of communion together. If you've got your elements with you, won't you take off uh, the first um, covering and just take the, the first thing?